Okay, I got 140, 159. We'll wait another minute and a half or so. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's update and Q&A to discuss member exits and financial flexibility during COVID-19. I am Matt Fisher, Senior Director of AmeriCorps at YouthBuild USA, and it's good to be with you today. For any Star Wars, Star Wars fans out there, may the fourth be with you. I'm joined by the other members of the AmeriCorps team, some of whom will be speaking with you directly and presenting some of today's information. Uh, that we hope is helpful for administering your AmeriCorps program during COVID-19. Few housekeeping items. Um, we want you to know that uh, the audio portion of the meeting, um, we're gonna keep everyone muted. Uh, so please don't forget to keep yourself muted. And as always, if you have immediate questions during the meeting, please feel free to chat, uh, write them in our chat box. Uh, we have special guest, Lord Vader. Uh, from the dark side, from the empire. Uh, he'll be checking in from time to time. We'll be checking in with uh, him to see if there's any questions. I hope you all and your families and youth build members continue to remain safe and healthy during these unprecedented times. I just want to thank everyone who continues to reach out to your portfolio manager regarding different options during COVID-19 as to how to best proceed um, during our current crisis. So moving along, I want to talk about today's agenda. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's a listing of today's agenda items. We'll be fielding questions around. As you can see, the main portion of the meeting will be focused on offering clarity and context to the policies and procedures our team released around April 30th in our e-newsletter regarding member exits due to COVID-19 service disruptions. We're gonna walk you through that process. In addition, we're gonna review some guidance related to fiscal flexibility as a result of COVID-19 that you may or may not be aware of. As we present, of course, if you have any questions regarding the content, please let us know by writing them in the chat box. We're gonna pause throughout uh, certain times and bring those questions to the larger group. Next slide, please, Lauren. As expressed during our last update, uh, the Corporation for National Community Service has really been doing its part as a federal agency to provide the most flexibility that it can within the federal regulations to members and grantees impacted by COVID-19 disruptions. Uh, CNCS has a dedicated COVID-19 FAQ page, which answers some of the most commonly asked questions members and programs have had during this crisis. Uh, the AmeriCorps team at YouthBuild USA has really been following these FAQs short, uh, closely and applying them to the YouthBuild context. Today's update and the one that we delivered on uh, April 20th is the application of some of that guidance. Next slide, please. As a reminder, uh, as CNCS provides this flexibility, we ask all subgrantees to first discuss with your portfolio manager what options the program might be considering before moving forward. CNCS guidance is continuously being updated and the future passage of relief packages in Washington, DC um, could make additional options available. Uh, for the latest up-to-date options, we always ask that you reach out to your portfolio manager. Next slide, please. Before we discuss member exits and financial flexibility during COVID-19, uh, we wanna provide a quick recap of our last webinar regarding the topic of adjusted service during, uh, due to COVID-19 service disruptions. Next slide. Our update on 420 discussed the flexibility CNCS is providing around service activities and the few ways programs could adjust member service to minimize the impact that COVID-19 is having on their ability to serve and earn AmeriCorps hours. Uh, that webinar uh, provides clarity and context around written guidance our team released around modified service, alternative service, and teleservice due to those COVID-19 service disruptions. Um, we just wanna make a plug, if you missed that presentation, we ask that you please review the webinar recording and the policy document pertaining to this topic which is located on our COVID-19 resources section of our website. We'll be plugging that at the conclusion of today's presentation. 
Please, mo please note that really to move on any adjusted service options, CNCS and or Youth Build USA approval may be needed and written policies may need to be in place before proceeding. Next slide. And an important aspect uh, from that presentation was made by Senior Portfolio Manager Lauren Vermouth, who provided an overview of the four options programs will be considering most likely during this crisis. Uh, Lauren made the important point that as time goes on, your program may end up utilizing most or all of these different options. And the approach may change over time and different options may make sense for different members. As a quick recap, we know that uh, the first option is to continue to provide approved service activities while adhering to current federal, state, and local public health and safety guidelines. This means that members are able to conduct their activities listed in their position description. Um, for many programs, um, you know, that might be smaller construction crews or having PPE uh, gear and taking the necessary precautions uh, uh, deemed necessary. Uh, for many programs, it's a possibility, but for some, it is not. So if you can't do this, you know, our guidance is to suspend members, especially if members were recently enrolled right after all of this started. If the program cannot continue to perform its normal service activities, then suspensions are currently probably the best option until service activities can resume. Please keep in mind, suspensions is not a negative in the AmeriCorps terms. They're a tool to help preserve a member's service term and give them the best chance of completing uh, their hours once they're available again. Um, and in fact, if a member isn't able to actually serve CNCS, it makes it a requirement that they, that they are suspended. So we could be out of compliance if members aren't doing anything and they're not suspended. Third option is adjusting service, which we had that whole webinar on, 420. Uh, this is something for people that to explore and consider while members are explored, uh, suspended. And we know a number of programs are taking advantage of this. And of course, the final option is to, if it makes sense, is to exit members due to COVID-19. And today's presentation will explore that more closely. Next slide, please. So let's dive into this topic, shall we? So let me turn things over uh, to Portfolio Manager Lauren Chiano and David Weatherly. I think Lauren, you're taking it from here. I am, yes. So um, I, as uh, Matt said, we're gonna be talking about exiting members specifically due to COVID-19 closures and service disruptions. So Lauren, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Before we dive into all of it, we want to make sure that you realize that a lot of resources are made available to you already on our website. So as you can see here in front of you, there's actually a new COVID-19 resources section of our AmeriCorps MyYB website. Um, there's a lot of resources on here, but specifically the policy and procedures that we are about to discuss with you are already on here. There's a policy and procedure document, as well as all of the forms that David is going to talk about in the second part of this presentation are already uploaded on this website. And in addition to that, um, this, web, this webinar right now is being recorded and we're gonna make it available to you after. So you can send it to your colleagues if they couldn't make it on live or it will be available to you uh, to review again. So we wanna go on to the next slide. So I'd like to start with language from CNCS, our funder. Uh, as we have mentioned in the past uh, webinars and Matt mentioned, the policies and procedures that we're developing are all based on FAQs that CNCS has been releasing and really updating very regularly. So the FAQ that's in front of you right now is the one that speaks directly to what we are presenting on today. So as you can see, an answer to the question of may members be exited if they are unable to serve. CNCS has answered that extended site closures and sustained disruptions could reasonably justify a compelling personal circumstance exit. And then they're referencing their own regulations. So this is the language that we are working off of and interpreting as we develop our own policy for how CPC exits can be used during COVID-19. And I think that one of the important things to take away from this is that we are still talking about compelling personal circumstance early exits. And we've trained on that before and many of you have done those already at your program. So CNCS is allowing COVID related closures and service disruptions to qualify 
as compelling personal circumstances. So that's the important context there. Now, there are obviously some new policies that are specific to COVID-related CPCs that I'm gonna be speaking to next. And I'm also gonna dive into this language in a little bit more depth in order to discuss what specifically qualifies and when these exits are going to be appropriate. And then after I have that conversation with you, Dave is gonna talk about how to actually administer those exits. Okay, so as I just said, there are pieces that remain the same and pieces that are brand new to the compelling personal circumstance exits that we are gonna be tying to COVID-19. We've shared this image a couple times now in past webinars, but I wanna reiterate that in addition to normal compelling personal circumstance rules, the CARES Act has provided CNCS with a waiver to allow members whose service is disrupted by COVID-19 to earn a full education award if they have served more than 50% of their hours and if completion of their service is no longer practicable due to COVID-19. So in this slide, I'm gonna focus on the one part of that that has to do with the hour requirements. And then in the next slides, I'm gonna focus on the second piece, which is what qualifies as no longer practicable. So in line with normal CPC rules, those whose service was disrupted by COVID-19, but have earned less than 15% of their hours, they are still not eligible for any part of their education award. That has not changed. Once a member has earned above 15% of their hours, they are eligible for a prorated or partial education award. Again, same as has always been the case. The item that is new is the item with that arrow next to it on your screen, and that is that members who have earned above 50% of their hours are now eligible for a full award instead of the partial. I wanna to go to the next slide. So now that we understand the hour percentages, which is the most straightforward piece of this, we need to focus on what specifically qualifies as not practicable due to COVID-19. So again, the language that's on your screen now is directly from CNCS and the FAQs, where they answer what circumstances would qualify for these exits. So as you can see listed in front of you, lack of service activities, or continued service, when continued service would pose a risk to the health or safety of the AmeriCorps member or others. Also, if a member tests positive for COVID-19, or a member self-identifies to be high risk and unable to serve due to risks posed by COVID-19. And the last one I'll explain more in a few minutes, but member, a member who has full-time caregiver responsibilities including situations in which the members regularly scheduled caregiver services have been canceled or disrupted due to COVID-19. So these are all the examples that CNCS lists for us. But even within that, you can see the program has a lot of discretion here, which is usually the case with compelling personal circumstances. So we are encouraging you to use the reasonable person test but also to work with your portfolio manager to discuss specific circumstances and when you have questions. For instance, if your program and or your partnering service sites have been shut down temporarily, for example, maybe for a few weeks, would a reasonable person say that that is an extended or sustained closure? Well, there isn't any specific number of days set by CNCS. So again, you will have to use your own discretion. For a member who is edging up on their graduation date and is looking to be placed, then yes, a shutdown of a few weeks may mean that an exit is now appropriate. But for a member who maybe is at the very beginning of their service term, maybe an exit is not appropriate right now. So we encourage you to think about what is in the best interest of the member and also encourage you to stay within the spirit of the waiver. And finally, we are always encouraging you to reach out to your portfolio manager to discuss specific questions. Uh, there is one specific question that we want to address. Um, it's a question that we've already been asked. Um, so we have already been asked, for instance, if it would be appropriate to exit a member with a full award due to COVID-19 because they've already gone over 50% of their hours 
and then be immediately re-enrolled. And so we wanna make it clear that we don't think that that would be appropriate or in the spirit of the waiver, and it would really open up risk for the program. And if you have any specific questions about that type of example, again, just reach out to your portfolio manager. So with all that said, what we're gonna do, what I'm gonna do next is walk through a few examples to hopefully try to flush out all of the different ways that you can use these exits. So Lauren, if you wanna to go to the first example. Okay, so David was enrolled on September 1st and he was supposed to exit June 30th. On average, he was serving 20 hours per week and COVID-19 caused his programs to close on March 15th. Regular in-person service was not available. However, his program was approved for alternative teleservice and he was able to serve remotely from March 15th to June 30th. Instead of serving 20 hours a week, however, he was only able to serve five. And on June 30th, David had completed 80% of his hours. So for the sake of time and simplicity, I am just going to review the, the answers to all of these scenarios and what the best outcome would be. Uh, so Lauren, if you just wanna click one more time. This one is pretty straightforward. It's just sort of introducing again, in this circumstance, of course, David can be exited with a documented CPC exit due to COVID-19, and he is gonna receive his full education award being at 80% of his hours. One of the overlaying pieces of all of these scenarios is going to be, can we tie the member's inability to complete their hours to COVID-19? And in this case, that's pretty clear. Okay, so in the next example, Matt enrolled January 15th and he was supposed to exit June 30th. COVID-19 caused his program to close on March 15th. And while Matt is engaged with online learning, because of COVID-19 restrictions, his program did not have any allowable service opportunities. And they did not feel confident that they would before Matt was ready to graduate in June. After Matt has been suspended for two months, he and his program decide that he will be exited. As of May 15th, Matt had earned 35% of his hours. So in this example, Matt can be exited also with a documented CPC exit, and he will receive a partial education award. So again, a slightly different scenario where in the first one, there was some uh, teleservice that was available for a period of time. In this one, the member had no service available. They were suspended for a short period of time and then they can be exited early. So both allowable CPC COVID-19 exits. So we wanna to go to the next one. Okay, and this is the one that's gonna explain that caregiver piece um, in a little bit more detail. So Lauren was enrolled February 15th and was supposed to exit October 15th. When her program had to close on March 15th due to COVID-19, she was suspended. The program has now developed approved teleservice activities and they plan to unsuspend their members so they can resume serving. Typically, Lauren takes her child to daycare so she can attend the program, but that daycare center is closed so Lauren has caregiver responsibilities and can't participate in the teleservice. And so we broke out um, two different examples about how to respond to this. The first one, um, here at this point in time, Lauren has earned 10% of her hours. So while her situation does apply under the CNCS regulations, the hour requirement has not been met yet. So she can't be exited with an education award right now, but one solution is that Lauren and the program can decide to leave her suspended, hoping that the daycare will reopen and Lauren can resume activities at the program. So the decision to exit does not need to be made immediately. She can say stay suspended hoping that the situation resolves. In the second example of this, um, if Lauren had already earned 20% of her hours, then everything about this situation qualifies her for a COVID-19 exit, and she can be exited with a partial education award. Okay. So the next scenario, Brandon was enrolled February 15th and was supposed to exit October 15th, when his program had to close on March 15th due to COVID-19, he was suspended. Program staff are hopeful though that they are gonna be able to reopen their service site in July and Brandon is motivated to finish his hours. 
So he stays suspended until the program starts service again on July 25th, and he returns. However, at the time of his program's graduation date in October, he was only able to earn 90% of his hours. So in this example, Brandon is still able to be exited early with a documented CPC exit due to COVID-19, and he will receive his full award. So again, this is an example where we don't want everyone to feel like they need to rush and decide if they need to exit all of their members right now. If you keep your members suspended right now and they return when your service site is open, and then even at that later date, if they can't complete all of their hours, the reason they couldn't complete all of their hours was because of service disruptions due to COVID-19, and these exit policies would still apply for them. And there's two more scenarios. So we've gotten a lot of questions about members who maybe were already suspended for other reasons before COVID-19 happened. Um, and so this is an area where we're gonna need to use that reasonable persons test. And I broke out two scenarios to try to help with that. So in this scenario, Mallory was enrolled October 15th and was supposed to exit June 15th. After attending regularly during the fall, Mallory had to be suspended in February for attendance issues due to a family crisis. Mallory has been in contact with her program staff and she was planning on returning to finish her hours. But now her program is closed and not offering any service opportunities because of COVID-19. And as of May 15th, Mallory had earned 40% of her hours. So in this circumstance, Mallory can be exited um, due to COVID-19 and she can receive that partial education award. Even though she was originally suspended for a different reason, the program knows what's going on. They've been in contact with her. They could get her in to sign her final paperwork. Um, and she was planning on returning to finish her hours. Um, and so a reasonable person could say the reason she wasn't able to finish her hours was actually because of COVID-19. But to contrast that, in the last example, Lauren was enrolled October 15th and was supposed to exit June 15th. Her attendance was sporadic and she was suspended after she stopped attending in December. Lauren's program has repeatedly tried to reach out to her, but have not heard anything and they don't know where she is. Lauren's program now has no service available because of COVID-19 restrictions and has decided it may need to exit their members early. And as of May 15th, Lauren had earned 20% of her hours. So this is one of the few examples that we're giving where Lauren cannot be exited with an education award. Um, without knowing what's going on, a reasonable person would look at this scenario and say that COVID-19 was not the reason that Lauren could not complete her hours. So we cannot apply these early exit policies to her and give her an education award. So there's gonna be a few examples like this at your program potentially, where it's not appropriate to use this opportunity for every member. And again, for any scenario like this that you're thinking through at your program, please reach out to your portfolio manager. Um, we're expecting to have a lot of these specific conversations with you to provide more clarity. But with that said, we came up to a question break now. So are there any questions based on anything that I have just presented? I don't know if there's not just that. I think people were uh, just internalizing all that information. But yeah, please put uh, your questions in the chat and we'll get to them a little later. Okay. Well, if there's not any questions right now, I guess um, we'll keep moving into the next section. I don't know if folks are putting in. Okay, so there's one now. So what documentation is acceptable for the exit under these circumstances? Are we gonna talk about that next? Yep, so hold on, uh, that's what's coming exactly next. Um, David's gonna dive into how you're gonna document all of this and what's required. So if that's the only question, we'll move into that section. Great, thanks Lauren. Um, so yeah, so uh, welcome everybody. I hope you guys are having a wonderful Monday. Um, so we're gonna dive into the documentation process for these exits and how they work. Um, so the breaks down into three main steps. Uh, the first being the documentation in the member file, exiting the member in eGrants, and then reporting exits to YouthBuild USA. Uh, so the first one is very similar to what already happens with personal compelling exits. 
and the other two have a couple new things uh, that have come in. Um, so we're going to have a question break in just a second. I see some folks putting things in the chat, but we will get to all of that. Um, uh, next slide, Lauren, please. So let's tackle the first piece of things in terms of getting documentation into the file. Uh, so you're gonna want our new COVID-19 hot off the presses CPC exit form. Um, it's like, it's basically a remix of a previous personal and compelling circumstances form, um, but it does specifically relate to COVID-19 and it is the form that we want you to use for these exits. Uh, so for both the partial and for the full exits, you're gonna use the same form. And you can find that on our website uh, that Lauren was referencing earlier and we'll get back to towards the end of the presentation. The other piece that you're gonna need are complete hour logs. Um, so your members do need to have a complete record of the hours they've earned because that's what you're gonna be included in e-grants. That's what you're gonna use to determine the 15% versus the 50%. And yes, we do need them to be signed. Now, uh, in terms of signing things, it, if you're not able to get the member to sign something in person, uh, there are electronic options like DocuSign. Um, if you're running into challenges with something like that, then talk to your portfolio manager and we'll see if we can work something out. But we do need to have member signatures for those hour logs and for the final evaluation. The COVID-19 exit form doesn't actually have a member signature, um, but the other two things would require that. And speaking of the final evaluation, uh, again, kind of making sure that that is completed and in the file. Uh, so for these exits, it's Re really you're in the circumstances where you're still talking with and communicating with your members. Um, this is something that you guys are working out together as a team. And so it shouldn't be the case that a young person has fallen off the map entirely and then you're exiting them on their behalf. They really should be involved in the process and have an understanding of what this personal compelling exit means for them. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to the next piece. Um, so let's talk about reporting things in eGrants. So, um, and this is a case where you are gonna have some deviation between what is in um, the partial exit versus the full exit. Um, so for the full exit, um, and we can go ahead and pop up uh, the little animations here. Um, so for the full exit, you're going to enter in their full hour term regardless of the number of hours that they served. So that's a little baby Yoda. Uh, checking out that hour block. Uh, so what does this mean? So this means that, say for example, you have a young person who completed 60% uh, of their hours. Uh, well, instead of putting the 60% in there, you're gonna put in the full amount, in this case, because the full-time slots, the 1,700 hours. And the reason for that is, is that's because how, that's how eGrants is going to calculate the value of that member's award. So that's how you get them a full-time award. But to indicate that it is a personal and compelling exit for COVID, um, in the next box, you're gonna indicate they're eligible for partial education award. Um, so we're not expecting you to retain all this right away, but just know for these full exits, the hours that you put into eGrants are gonna be a bit different than what is on their hour log. Um, now for a partial exit, it's easy peasy. You use the hours you have on the hour log and you select the eligible for partial and move forward. Um, so that's fairly straightforward, but for these over 50% special exits, um, that's when you need to make sure you're using the full hours based on their slot type. Uh, so let's go on, move on to the next thing, Lauren, please. All right, uh, so the last thing that we need you guys to do for us is sending information to Youth Build USA. Um, so we created a spreadsheet um, that's available on the website that is a form to document all the members related to this. So it's very straightforward. Um, you're just putting in the members, last name, first name, their eGrants ID or NSP ID, uh, their slot type, how many hours they've served, um, and then checking off whether you've completed that form that we were just talking about. Um, it'll do the math for you. So if you don't wanna do the 15% and 50% calculations, um, there's a column there that'll let you know whether they qualify for the full award or the partial award. Um, so ideally what we'd want you to do is complete this as you go. Um, so as you're exiting members, um, please you know, fill this out and then you only need to send it to us once. So you send it to us by December 31st after 
you have uh, sorted out all of the members who are going to be related for COVID related 19 exits um, on there. And importantly, it's only for those exits. So you're not going to be including uh, any other partial exits. You're not going to be including um, successful exits um, that, you know, members are already at 100%. Um, you're not going to be including unsuccessful exits. It's just exits related to COVID-19. Um, and that's because CNCS has asked us to report on those. Um, so we want to give her that information and give it to CNCS um, in an organized manner. So one thing um, I skipped over a little bit, I just want to circle back to um, is when we're talking about what qualifies as acceptable documentation. So in addition to the form, you do want something to support the fact that this was a COVID related exit. Um, we're being fairly generous in terms of what that documentation is. It could be um, a stay at home order that was issued in your state or local ordinance. It could be uh, your internal policy. You know, say you have an internal memo stating that we are not conducting service activities between these dates. Um, or it could be something related specifically to the member. So, you know, in some of those examples that Lauren had in terms of like a caregiver, or something like that, you might want something more specific related to the member. Um, but if there's any question about what documentation would be acceptable, uh, please reach out to us when you have that conversation. In I think most cases, you're gonna have one piece of documentation that's gonna serve for most of your members. Like I said, you know that internal memo that's talking about the site closing down, um, and then you could just reference that in each of the files and keep that on file and have that just be your one piece of documentation. Um, but depending on different member circumstances, you might need different things. Um, so with that, we're gonna go ahead and pause for a second for questions. I know I saw a few in the chat, so we'll get to those. Um, there is Matt Clerico in his full Lord Vader uh, gear, uh, as you guys got to witness earlier. So uh, yeah, so please uh, ask us your questions and we will promise not to force choke you. Okay, so is there a time frame in which compelling personal circumstances will no longer be allowed? So say someone started in April and then we discern that, you know, sometime in the fall, oh, Johnny's not going to make his hours because of this pause that happened in the spring. What's the, what's the time frame for being able to use these exits? Sure, so that's a good question. Um, and somebody can chime in if, if, I'm, if I'm incorrect, but I, I don't believe CNCS has established any sort of time frame regarding uh, these exits. Um, and falling back to kind of what we we're talking about earlier in terms of the reasonable person test. Um, so if you can reasonably establish how this individual service term was affected by COVID-19, I think it would be allowable. Um, but you know, I think what we really want to avoid are things that, um, are intentionally kind of just using this as a tool uh, to try and get around our requirements. That's, that's what we want to avoid. Um, but absolutely, if the young person's service was affected by COVID-19, then uh, they'd potentially qualify. So um, the form that goes in the member files, uh, you know, to designate them as COVID-19 or affected by that, can this be fill, filled out electronically and signed electronically by the young per person? Yes, so that specific form does not require a member signature, um, but you know, it, you know the the member hour logs and those things can be signed electronically. Um, you know, the guidance is you have something similar to DocuSign, um, where it has a very clear record of that electronic signature. Um, so you want to make sure there's like a very clear timestamp and there's a very clear way that it cannot be manipulated. Uh, so those are kind of the, the basic requirements for signatures, but electronic signatures are definitely an option. Okay, um, so the, Amanda has a very long question and I think kind of goes along with the earlier one. So say a member gets uh, suspended in March because of all of this, had about 20% of their hours, starts again in the summer, but runs out of time before they can get their full hours, would they still be okay for the um, the full award over 50%? Yes, I mean, so uh, just reading through the description, it uh, sounds like similar to one of the scenarios that Lauren described earlier. Um, so just the that member, their, their service term was cut short based to COVID-19. So 
Um, but you know, just because they sort of paused and restarted doesn't make them ineligible. Um, so you know, folks can uh, earn hours on their way to trying to get as many as they can, um, but they would still be eligible. And where will the CPC spreadsheet be located, David? Sure. Um, so I think as we've mentioned a few times, it's going to be under the COVID-19 resource section of our website. Um, you know, we'll have a link to that a little later in the presentation. If you have trouble finding it, let us know and we can send you the link directly. Um, but if you just go to our website, you click on the resources section, then you should see it on the right hand side, COVID-19. Um, and then I'll take you there. That's all we have for now. Great. All right. So uh, if there are no more questions, you know, again, feel free to have them keep coming in the chat. Um, but with that, I will turn things over to Brandon to talk a little bit all about the fiscal side of things. All right. Thank you, David. If you could advance the slide one more time. All right, so I'll start by referencing the OMB Office of Management and Budgets memos that were released in March. Uh, and I encourage anyone that's responsible for grant administration to take a look at those memos. Uh, these two memos really set off the federal response framework for granting administrative relief to any uh, program who is experiencing any sort of operational loss of capacity during this time. So these memos point out about 13 flexibilities. I would say some of these are new flexibilities. Some of these are authorities that agencies already had. Um, really, there's two that are key to look at in the memos. I believe they are points six and seven, which really address billing staff time and various other expenses during this time. So if we can go to the next slide. One thing to keep in mind with this administrative relief is that it is short-term relief. If you look at the sec second memo, it's a 90-day period, which starts from the date of the memo and goes until June uh, 17th of 2020, uh, at which time OMB will sort of uh, reassess the situation. So you could expect to see this extended. Uh, next slide. So first question, and this was addressed directly by CNCS and their FAQs. Uh, the question is, can we bill costs related to the cancellation of events, activities, and travel? And the answer is simply yes, uh, if it's related to an interruption of operation and services. Uh, the way CNCS words this is to treat it like a weather-related cancellation uh, for safety reasons. And I would say if you have any travel or any events that are built into your approved AmeriCorps budget, uh, you can bill that cancellation in one of your AmeriCorps reimbursement requests. We just ask to see documentation of that cancellation, however that may look. Next question, or next slide, please. Uh, this is some Youth Build USA guidance. So what, if any, emergency expenses may we bill to the grant? What is the process for requesting approval for these expenses? The answer is emergency expenses and supplies may be billed to the grant permitted that they are treated consistently across the program. And so this is typically uh, how we do budget mods, as long as the cost is reasonable, allowable, allocated across funding sources and documented, it is allowable. I would say most of the expenses that you may wanna work into your budget at this time were already allowable. Uh, I can think of things like personal protective equipment. Um, some programs are definitely utilizing Zoom to connect with staff. You can certainly bill that subscription to the grant, uh, as well as DocuSign if you're having to sign timesheets electronically. Um, some other examples, I, I've seen some programs bill uh, Chromebooks. If your members need access, uh, you can certainly work those into the budget. But the process for the modification is no different than how we typically do it. So if you want to work in any new line items, just go to your most recent uh, expense and match workbook. You'll find a budget mod tab, and you can simply reallocate those expenses and send that along to your fiscal manager. Next slide. All right, now we get to staff. Now staff can fall into uh, you know, two camps. Can grant funds be used to pay for staff if they are teleworking? 
The answer is yes. Can we bill staff who are on administrative leave? The answer is yes. Now this is where the guidance is changing a bit. It's been evolving over the past few weeks. In the past, we've said to have a memo on file to justify what staff are doing during this time if the operations or the building is closed and members are suspended. Uh, what we're recommending is uh, to meet the administrative prerequisites, which is to have a policy that applies to your entire workforce. So you can certainly bill uh, any staff time they are teleworking if you have a policy in place that applies to the entire workforce. And the same for administrative leave. If you have staff that can't come into the building, um, the nature of their work doesn't allow them to telework. Maybe they do, you know, person to person grant work. Um, you can bill them to the grant. Next slide. So what if you do not have these policies in place? Uh, a lot of the guidance is pointing to develop these policies right now and make the effective dates the circumstances begin. So we're working with a 90 day period. So you can do this as early as March 19th um, and as, as effective at the moment till June 17th until that changes. So some minimum requirements we'll wanna see in those policies for staff who are on administrative leave is to first see that the policy applies to the entire workforce, not just grant funded staff positions, the effective dates of the policy, and the policies address continuation for staff members who are unable to work for reasons beyond their control or if their job status changes in terms of their uh, full-time status as it relates to COVID. All right, next slide. All right, and finally, we get to some CNCS guidance related to match. Now this language is directly from CNCS. You can see this is point number 24 in their FAQs. So I'll read the exact language and then we'll sort of debrief. So CNCS is waiving all match requirements for all AmeriCorps state and national cost reimbursement grants that were awarded in fiscal year 2019 and fiscal year 2020, including all state and national grants that will be awarded during the remainder of fiscal year 2020. So what that means for us is that this will apply to AmeriCorps grant year 1920, as well as AmeriCorps grant year 2021. All right, continuing on, CNCS has the authority to issue a, issue a blanket waiver uh, when CNCS determines that such a waiver would be equitable due to lack of resources at the local level. AmeriCorps state and national grantees who wish to take advantage of this waiver in full or part do not have to take any action at this time. CNCS will provide additional FAQs in the near future that outline the implementation process. So I would say YouthBuild USA is taking a conservative approach since we are waiting on additional guidance. We have the, the match waiver. So if you are concerned with meeting the 50% match requirements in grant year 1920, there is relief you will not be held accountable to that requirement. Although we do recommend and encourage that you continue to bill, or not bill, but report a match in your monthly reimbursement requests, business as usual. But if you are having a hard time meeting that requirements, we're not gonna hold you to it. Um, and this also applies to grant year 2021. So going into that grant year, if there are concerns with meeting the match requirements, um, you will not be held in that grant year uh, not be held responsible in that grant year as well. Um, I believe this guidance was issued around maybe April 9th. We are waiting on updated guidance. There's a call, I believe, tomorrow. It could come at any moment. So I would be on the lookout for further guidance once we know how to actually implement this process. All right, I believe I will stop there um, and I will give the chat some few minutes if you wanna ask any fiscal related questions as it pertains to any of these flexibilities. Brandon, I have a question. So um, say we get some guidance uh, tomorrow during the um, state and national call or soon, How? what's the plan for rolling that out? The implementation of the new guidance or the uh, announcements? 
Well, the announcements, like how it'll work, the implementation. Uh, I can't say for the implementation, but I definitely know we will pass that information along as to what CNCS expects. Um, at the moment, they're making it seem like it's a very low lift. Um, there's nothing you need to do to take advantage of it. Um, but we're still waiting to see how that rolls into e-grants and our uh, budget at USA as well. Um, so at the moment, we're not doing anything different. Okay. No, I, I guess I was just wondering if, if we were going to plan a webinar about that for fiscal folks or if there'll be a special email. I would say at the moment, a special email, depending on how much it takes to implement. We'll see if a webinar is um, uh, needed. All right. Okay, we'll give it another moment or two, see if we've got any questions about the fiscal, the fiscal portion. Okay. Um, nothing yet. Yeah, I mean, I think we can go. I mean, we have one last chance for ask questions. So if folks do think of anything fiscal related, please put it into the chat. Um, there was one programmatic question that came up that we didn't get to last time uh, around uh, the training hours. So the, the questions around, um, you know, if their member has earned um, over 50% of their hours, um, but the majority of them are training hours or they're over that 20% limit, um, would that still qual the, qualify for them for the full versus partial award? Uh, so that's a great question. Um, so the answer is uh, they would they would likely only qualify for the partial in that case because you still can't get around the 20% training limit. Um, so at exit, that 20% training needs to be proportional to their service hours. So you can't have a member who, um, and you know, understandably so, but say you guys are doing pretty much all uh, telelearning right now and members are earning training hours, um, if they don't have enough service hours to get them to that 15%, um, to get to them to that 50%, um, then they unfortunately would not qualify uh, for the award. So please uh, pay attention to where your folks are at with training hours. Um, it's listed on the member hour log. You can see the chart in terms of how they're doing. And there's the exit helper kind of built into the member hour log as well. So if you have questions about kind of how to count training hours, you know, let us know and we can walk you through that. Uh, so just last couple of things to highlight here. Um, we want you to make you aware that there are some resources out there. Um, so uh, Matt Fisher earlier referenced the CNCS FAQ. Um, so here's kind of part of their website. So if you uh, kind of Google CNCS uh, COVID-19, you'll take you to their resource page with all the questions, uh, the FAQs and, and additional information they have. Uh, and then Lauren, you can go to the next slide. Uh, and then on our end, um, uh, Lauren uh, Triano showed this earlier. Um, so, you know, we do have our website up and operating with our COVID-19 resources. So please take a look at that. Again, includes everything from uh, the alternative service we were talking about on the 420 webinar, as well as all the information from today's webinar. Um, so check that out, it has all the forms. Um, if you can't find it, let us know and we can send you guys a link. Uh, and then lastly, um, and Lauren, you can go to the next one with the AFNET. Um, they also have a resource page um, where they're collecting resources. Um, so you can go there. Um, so this is more general youth build resources. But, you know, if you're looking for, you know, what are other people doing with their staff policies and how, you know, what are some other activities that they're doing with young people? Uh, this is a place to go to find those resources. If you have a resource that's working well for your program, you can share them with AFNET, or if they're related to AmeriCorps, you can share them with us, and we'll make sure that they get out there. So, uh, you know, we're doing our best to try to provide resources. Please let us know uh, if there's any way we can help out. Um, so I think with that, we'll pause one more time for questions, see if there's anything else out there. But I want to thank everybody for taking the time out. Uh, to join us and talk this through. Um, you know, again, it's kind of a, how does the old Paris go? May you live in interesting times. We're definitely doing that right now. Um, but I appreciate everybody putting in the effort to figure this out uh, with us as we go. Uh, and, you know, please let us know about any questions or comments or concerns you may have.
Uh, so Matt, was there anything else that came up in the chat? Um, will there be any relaxation of the requirement for members to be employed or enrolled um, in post-secondary ed education um, 30 days after an early exit? Sure. So, um, you know, this would mainly apply to um, some of the reporting measures, I, I presume is what uh, Corey is talking about there. Um, so we have not heard any updated guidance on performance measures and how those may or may not be counted differently. It will definitely be part of our narrative when reporting performance measures to CNCS um, around how COVID-19 has disrupted the network. It's definitely a conversation that you can have with your portfolio manager. We're going to be talking more about performance measures, uh, you know, getting into mid-May and definitely part of our June conference calls. Um, so we'll have that conversation a bit more in depth then. Um, but we have not gotten any updated guidance that I'm aware of. Not yet, anyways. That's the last question we have. Great. Um, well, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Um, I really appreciate you guys spending some time with us. Uh, thanks to everybody help putting in the webinar together. And um, I appreciate everybody putting up with all my Star Wars references. So. Uh, may the fourth be with everybody. Hope you all have a good week. Um, and if anything else comes up, just let us know. Thank you.